just opened but the conference took place in another room uh, because they hadn't uh, started operating things yet so it's very nice actually to be here also as a new local. Um, okay, so the context of my talk, uh, so the subject is quite different from uh, sort of the dynamics of the talks yesterday. So with a bit of context and minor um, connection points. Um, so the context is the study of uh, wave evolution, so wave equations on uh, space-times uh, arising in general relativity. Um, okay, and so I will look at uh, certain four-dimensional manifolds M equipped with a Lorentz metric G, so Lorentz metric uh, with a sort of minus plus plus sec plus signature. Um, an example will follow in just a second. And um, let's just imagine, so for the purpose of this talk, that M is actually the product of uh, some time uh, a direction and a spatial three manifold. Um, and uh, okay, so we look at the wave equation here. So box B, B is equal to zero, and we're interested in understanding the long time behavior of the solution of this equation for various uh, space times and metrics G. Okay, so the, so the question is what is the late time or long time uh, asymptotic behavior? of phi, let's say phi of t and x, as t goes to infinity. And uh, there are various uh, ways in which you can uh, make that question a bit more precise. So the first thing that you might uh, hope for or uh, inquire about is uh, whether uh, phi decays at all. Okay, so whether the amplitude of waves decays to zero when time goes to infinity. Um, if that is so, that's uh, sometimes called uh, linear stability. So in this talk, I will only look at uh, linear equations anyway, so I can as well make the linear here. Um, a weaker version of uh, decaying would be uh, uh, phi remains bounded, so or at least <coughs> remains bounded. And uh, this might uh, already seem like a sort of funny question, because uh, why should solutions of wave equations grow in time? Uh, out of bounds. So let me just give you one example where uh, you know where your intuition might be coming from, um, which is um, uh, the wave equation of Minkowski space. So the metric here is minus dt squared plus dx squared. So x here is uh, r3, and I write dx squared for the Euclidean yes. metric because zone tight. And uh, okay. <laughs> and the the wave equation here. Uh, box phi uh, is then equal to, depending on sign conventions, minus the second uh, t derivative plus the sum of second spatial derivatives of phi is equal to zero. And uh, okay, so for such a wave equation, you also have to impose two pieces of initial conditions. Uh, say you specify what phi is equal to at zero, comma x at t equals zero, and also the time derivative of phi at t equals zero. And then there exists a unique solution of this equation. And so um, what kind of thing can one say regarding this first point uh, for the solution of this equation? Well, as is pretty well known, there exists a conserved quantity, the energy, which is uh, typically defined as one half, so energy at time t. It's one half times the integral over r3 in space of, um, so try it like, uh, like this. So dtu of t and x squared plus dxu of t and x squared dx, um, and this is a conserved quantity, so e of t is constant, and so in particular it's equal to the energy of the initial data. And so just from the existence of this conserved quantity, which moreover is um, coercive, right, so it, it controls at least the derivatives of u, um, you immediately see that, well, at least the, you know, in a certain sense here, some Sobolev space, say, uh, the solution of this equation will definitely remain bounded for all time. Please. What's the relation between u and phi? Oh, sorry, uh, phi, yeah. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Okay, so you just uh, differentiate this and integrate by parts in, in space once, so we, uh, 
uh, pretending you can do all these things. Uh, and then you find that the derivative of the energy is uh, zero. Okay, so um, here you have uh, sort of a, roughly speaking, a positive answer to the question. Yes, the solution remains bounded in some sense um, because of the existence of this conserved energy. Okay, but it turns out that uh, many space times do not admit such coercive conserved energies, and in that case, the question of boundedness, um, even boundedness, let alone decay, is much more delicate. Okay, so um, so this question number one here is uh, you know, difficult, and the answer is not always positive uh, in the absence of, uh, say, coercive energies. Okay, so energy just meaning some quantity typically involving the square of your uh, solution V. Okay, and uh, okay, so that's sort of a qualitative question here. And then um, if you have decay or boundaries or whatever, you can also ask about more specific, uh, more quantitative information about uh, the long time behavior. So perhaps if it decays, what is the decay rate, exponential or inverse polynomial, and related. Um, Question, um, does P have an asymptotic expansion uh, as T goes to infinity? Okay. So um, in this talk, the space times turn out to be such that uh, waves um, have expansions into um, terms of the sort uh, E to the minus I omega T. And these are, of course, uh, very well known for, you know, for instance, uh, decay of correlations um, kind of questions, where you have these so-called uh, so resonance expansions for suitable complex numbers omega. Um, and also in this context of decay of correlation, for instance, uh, if you have some measure-preserving flow or something like that, uh, then the correlation of two functions, so you pull back one function by the flow, integrate it against the other function, uh, that is obviously bounded. Um, and so that's sort of a little analog of this conserved uh, energy statement here. Um, okay, and so in the case of uh, decay of correlations, it's clear that some of the correlation uh, function remains bounded, and uh, if you're lucky, has an expansion into um, you know, uh, some constant term plus exponentially decaying further contributions. But again, in this, uh, in this more general, uh, on more general space times, in the absence of conserved energies, um, it's not even obvious whether uh, the solution of the uh, wave equation will decay exponentially to a constant, let's say. Um, okay, and I just want to briefly say that these two questions here, um, what is the decay rate and does there exist an asymptotic expansion, they're a little bit distinct. It's of course possible that a solution of an equation has an asymptotic expansion involving an exponentially growing term. Okay, so it doesn't have to decay um, and yet have an asymptotic expansion. Okay, and such situations do occur. Okay, so that's uh, sort of the context. And uh, if you can answer these various questions, then you can try to upgrade uh, your information about the solution of the linear wave equation, box G, C equals zero, to understand uh, nonlinear problems, but um, like stability problems, but I will not discuss that here. Okay, so I want to um, explain one particular, uh, one particular setting um, here of space times, which is that of black, hole, uh, black holes in the sitter space. So Schwarzschild de Sitter, or SDS, black hole. Um, so um, these are certain four manifolds. And so here, uh, M will be essentially equal to well, time cross space. And uh, space here uh, is a subset of R3, um, which is an angular. So you have some radius R plus, some other radius RC. And then two sphere, and uh, the metric can be written down explicitly. Um, so it's actually a very simple form. So there's some function f, some sort of warping factor, minus f of r times dt squared plus one over f of r times dr squared plus r squared times the standard metric on the two sphere. And so if this uh, function f was just equal to one, this would be the Minkowski metric relativity in polar coordinates. But for this Schwarzschild dissidence space time, um, this function f is uh, something different. And at the end of the talk, I will actually need to use the specific form that it has. So let me just write it down here already. 
this particular uh, rational function, 1 minus 2m over r minus lambda r squared. And so here, m is the black hole mass. And we'll try to explain in what sense uh, this metric describes the black hole in a moment. And lambda, is some positive constant, is the so-called cosmological constant. Okay, and uh, so this function here, let me just for completeness, the graph looks something like, like that. This f of r, and these uh, numbers r plus and rc uh, are uh, two simple roots of this function. Okay, and then you can do uh, a little calculation and uh, realize that this function has two simple positive roots um, under a certain condition on the mass and uh, the cosmological constant, namely, uh, this quantity lambda m squared has to be between zero and the ninth. Okay, fine. So these are sort of physical um, restrictions here. And um, let me just briefly say the first word already about these r plus and rc numbers. It turns out that they're uh, so-called event and cosmological horizon of the black hole. And uh, when m is small, so let's say when lambda m squared is very small, uh, then the so-called event horizon at r plus is well approximated by 2 times m. And perhaps some of you have seen this number, 2 times the mass of the black hole as the Schwarzschild radius. And uh, r sub c is roughly equal to the square root of 3 over lambda. Okay, so when lambda, this cosmological constant, is positive but very small, which it's supposed to be in our universe, this cosmological horizon, or the boundary of the observable universe, distance from us of the boundary of the observable universe, uh, is very, very big. Okay? So th that's just for scale. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so that's a short to consider black hole. And I'll draw more informative pictures of it uh, in just a moment. Um, I just want to pay lip service to uh, a generalization of this so-called Herdesitter black hole metric ADS. Um, and it's again an explicit uh, metric which depends in addition to the mass and this uh, fixed cosmological constant also on uh, parameter A that's upgraded to a vector in R3, um, which plays the role of angular momentum. Okay, and so um, again, it's a perfectly explicit metric but um, it's just a bit more ugly and nobody learns anything from staring at it and nobody can even remember it. You have to always look it up in some old paper and hope that there's no propagation of typos. Um, okay, and so what's the point of these metrics in any case? Um, it turns out that uh, this here is basically the unique solution of the einstein back equations. So of G is equal to find out G that has uh, spherical symmetry and uh, so this was already discovered in the 1920s, and the curtis sitter solution was found by, as the name suggests, Carter in 1968. Um, and it's also a solution of that equation um, uh, without spherical symmetry, but it still has axial symmetry. So it describes a rotating black hole with axis of rotation given by this A. And when A is equal to zero, uh, you get back the schwarzschild sitter family. Okay, so it's a generalization of this uh, non-rotating schwarzschild sitter black hole uh, metric. Okay, so in the formulas there is some uh, geometry here. Um, so let me try to draw that. And uh, to do that, um, I want to somehow explain uh, you know, the geometric properties of this metric here. Um, it's very right, these metrics of the to ignore the S2 factor and only focus on the T and R variables here. I'm going to draw uh, sort of a a uh, curvy linear coordinate grid, T and R, um, which looks as follows. Okay. Well, that's not exactly even, but okay. Okay, so here's T equals zero, and uh, here's another T level set. Okay, so these are level sets of the function T, and uh, here's R equals some other constant, rather, and here's another level set. Okay, so these are 
are equal to constant level set. And uh, out here is the outer horizon. This one here is where r is equal to rc. On the left hand side, r is equal to r plus. And also down here, even though we will not care about this bottom part. Okay, so this is a, a, a weird way of drawing the coordinate grid. But the point here is that um, if you draw a horizontal line and then a line going at 45 degrees upwards uh, to the right or left, uh, then these directions here, right, they, they become tangent vectors at any point uh, in this diagram here. And these are uh, light-like directions or null directions. So meaning, uh, at any point in this picture, if you draw a 45 degree line that way or that way, so a tangent vector, um, then this is a tangent vector, so you know, something like partial t plus some number times partial r, um, which has the property that its squared length with respect to this uh, non-degenerate uh, inner product here is equal to zero. So that's exactly what a light-like direction is. Okay, and so photons or gravitational waves or something like that roughly propagate along these 45 degree lines. Okay, and so um, in this picture here, um, if you are, I should take a different color still. Uh, right, so if you're somebody who starts out uh, their life here and then moves uh, in this direction, for instance, you encounter this uh, r equals r plus, uh, it turns out in finite parameter time along, uh, along a geodesic here. Um, and it turns out that actually the um, this place where I made my manifold stop right, at r equals r plus, because the metric ceases to be smooth there, it's actually just a coordinate singularity. So we can actually um, pass to a better coordinate system uh, that doesn't become sort of singular here along the boundary of this rhombus. Okay, so let me write this down. So better coordinates uh, can be introduced, and it suffices to actually change the t coordinate to something that I call t star. And I will not write down what exactly it is, but it's roughly t um, plus minus, uh, minus the absolute value of the logarithm of that uh, of that function f. Uh, this function f is zero at the, near these two horizons, so this is a singular coordinate change uh, near the horizons. So you have the chance of desingularizing the geometry with it, and the end result of doing this is the following. So I again draw one part of this picture, and now the level sets of this T star function are actually like this. Here's T star is equal to zero, and the metric extends uh, smoothly across uh, these two horizons to say two times RC and one half times R plus. I mean, one half and two are just random numbers. Here. Okay, so uh, the metric extends analytically um, to a larger uh, domain here, and of course still satisfies the Einstein vacuum equation and so on. Okay, and so from this picture now I can explain in what sense uh, this metric is supposed to describe a black hole. Because if I take again, uh, you know, some observer like this, moving perhaps uh, uh, not at the speed of light, but at less than the speed of light, which means moving upwards at, uh, at less of an angle. So if I look at this observer here, and uh, they have crossed the event horizon at r equals r plus, and they decide that uh, uh, they only read the relativity book once they've crossed here and say, well, instead of a black hole, it's a dangerous place. Let's try to get back out. But they can at most move at the speed of light, so at most at 45 degrees upwards. And so you see that they can never cross, just for geometric reasons here, this uh, 45 degree dashed line. Okay, so once they're out here, they cannot come back to the outside uh, world. And so that's the black hole interior. And you see that on the other side of this picture, you have the same, uh, same geometry. So once somebody crosses into this region, they cannot come back in the interior part here either. But it turns out that this region here, when R is very big, is actually geodesically complete. There's no black hole singularity or anything like that lurking there. So that part is safe, um, physically speaking. But geometrically, um, these two uh, hypersurfaces, R equals R plus and RC, um, have the same uh, kind of behavior. Okay, so that's a bit of the geometry. And then um, we have now the stage set to try and understand waves evolving on this space time. So at this point, are there any questions? 
Would you usually short shift correspond to where RC going to infinity? That's right, yes. Yeah. So you can actually just formally set lambda equals zero, uh, and then you get the short shift metric. Mm -hmm. So that will actually play an important role uh, eventually. Take the other one after all. these uh, metrics uh, set up, you can look at the initial value problem for the wave equation on such a space time. Um, okay, and uh, so I'm gonna just, I'm sorry. Something happened. Yeah, okay. So the initial value problem, um, as I indicated before, takes the following form. So box phi is equal to zero. And uh, I will now put in a lot of subscripts here. So you have the metric G the Kerr de Sitter metric, which depends on lambda, m, and a. Um, okay, and uh, we have to specify initial data, namely phi, and the time derivative of phi at t star equals zero, and uh, so these two initial amplitude and time derivative of the wave, uh, let's just take them to be smooth compact supported functions, not oh, smooth functions, um, on what I'll call x, and I'm going to commit an uh, app use of notation. So it is now the manifold on which I work. Um, it's actually just the part that I drew on the bottom right. So it's 0 to infinity in t star times x, where x is now this enlarged domain. So from 1 half times r plus to 2 times rc times s2. Right. So here we have x. The zero level set, say, of our time function, <coughs> uh, and then we study the wave equation in this domain omega. Okay? And uh, so this initial value problem is well posed, that sort of standard um, you know, hyperbolic existence theory here. And the question is what can you say about the long time behavior of the solution phi of this equation? Okay, and so this has been a um, long studied uh, subject, and so I'm going to uh, write down um, sort of the, the theorem due to um, many people that will be quoted in a moment. Okay, so for a, suitable, for a suitable constant C, and I'll explain what I mean by suitable in a moment, um, you do have a residence expansion of the solution of this equation. So let me write it down in a mildly cheating way. So uh, phi of t star in x minus a sum over resonances, um, we call them omega j, which lie in the upper half space uh, bounded by magic particles minus c, then you have uh, e to the minus i omega j t star times e j of x. Okay, so remember that t star goes to infinity here. Uh, okay, so this difference uh, of the solution and some uh, partial uh, expansion here is bounded by e to the minus constant times t star. And so the mildly cheating aspect, I suppose, uh, is that I'm not sure actually whether uh, some of these resonances might uh, sort of be non-simple, in which case you have some t star to some you know, polynomial power uh, floating around as well. But um, I'm going to emit that detail as a talk. Um, OK, and so um, in what contexts is this now known? So the first result. Um, directly on this was proved by Bunny and Hafner in 2008. Uh, and they studied the case that the angular momentum, so I'm dropping the vector here, the angular momentum is equal to zero, so that's the Schwarzschild to Sitter case. Um, and they proved this uh, resonance expansion for arbitrary uh, constant c. They, is it in supnorm? Is it the, the estimate? Is in yeah, so here it's in supnorm, but uh, um, it's usually proved with some solar spaces. But this estimate follows from, Sobolev, uh, from these Sobolev estimates via Sobolev embedding. Yeah. So it's also true for all derivatives uh, uh, in X. And uh, you can also differentiate this term-wise in T star and so on. Yeah. OK, so that's the uh, other questions. Uh, is that, are those UJ just smooth? Uh, yeah, that's right. So I'm going to explain exactly what these UJs are uh, in a moment. And uh, so there are solutions of a certain equation. I mean, 
this expression here solves the wave equation. Um, yeah, I'll write that down in a moment. Other way. Or all x, uh, all, uh, the, all, yes. x, all x in this. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you can also like if you want to put a soup here. Yeah. It's always a finite sum. Uh, no, it isn't. And I'll draw a picture of that too. So for um, when c is too big, then there's actually an infinitude of resonances in strips. Um, but Bodhi and Hafner nonetheless show that this uh, infinite sum in that case uh, does converge. Yeah. Um, okay, and so they use some in, uh, input that I'll also write down uh, explicitly by uh, Savareto and Zworski regarding the location of these resonances. Um, the place all there. Um, okay, so that's the Schwarzschild de Sitter case, and then Dyatlov, in a series of works in the 2010s, uh, studied the case when a divided by m, which uh, is a dimensionless quantity just like this lambda m squared that I had up there, uh, when that is very small, also in, in all this here, lambda is positive. And so it does not apply to the Schwarzschild uh, case. Mm -hmm. uh, so he studied this case here and also obtained this result for essentially arbitrary c. I mean, you have to emit those Cs where there are actually like too many resonances uh, nearby, but otherwise arbitrary. And you can have resonance with uh, pos positive imaginary part or not? Huh? Um, so <coughs> here, in these, uh, all the resonances are act either zero or have negative imaginary part. But this will cease to be the case uh, in parts three and uh, four that I'm going to write down. But uh, since you asked me, I'm going to define that the validity of this statement here is what's called mode stability. And I'll discuss this uh, more. And so this, uh, this statement means that, uh, well, if omega is zero, you have a constant term, and it turns out the corresponding uj here is just a constant. Uh, so you have exponential decay to constant because all other resonances uh, contribute exponentially decaying terms. In the physics literature, for instance, once uh, they have convinced themselves that uh, mode stability holds, then they declare that uh, uh, the corresponding nonlinear field equations and some have global solutions. Uh, so they take some larger steps there. So it needs to justify with a lot of work. But uh, sort of mode stability is really a crucial element in um, uh, also the nonlinear theory. Um, okay, so these are the parts one and two. Uh, so number three is that Bashi in 2013, um, went up to a over m is, I think, square root of 3 over 2, which is like 0.866 something. Um, and uh, he obtained this result when c is less than some constant c0, um, which in this case, um, yeah, so c0 here is some positive number. Uh, and it can be computed from um, basically the Lyapunov exponent at a trapped set that uh, appears in these space times. So I'm, I won't have to talk about trapping in this talk, luckily. But um, uh, this constant here uh, can in principle be computed from dynamical information about, this, uh, about the null geodesic flow in this space time. And then uh, finally, uh, Peterson and Bashi in 2021, at least that's the preprint time. Uh, they extended this to the full, full sub-extremal range. I'll explain what that means in a second. And again, uh, the same sort of restriction that uh, the exponential decay rate uh, that you get as the remainder there is bounded by some dynamically computable quantity. Um, but I should point out that in these two cases, uh, mode stability uh, is not part of the statement. Basically, we put question marks here because it's not, not proof there. So that relates to what I said at the very beginning, that you can have asymptotic expansions or at least partial expansions, um, allowing for exponentially growing contributions. Um, you know, that's, that's still acceptable. But at least the solution has, an, has a partial expansion into finitely many terms, in these two cases, up to an exponentially decaying remainder. But uh, as I hinted at, uh, for certainly nonlinear applications, if the solution of the linear equation has even just one exponentially growing contribution, then um, you're probably in big trouble. Okay, so mode stability um, for nonlinear purposes is, uh, is a very crucial ingredient. For linear analysis, you have a nice result, you can go home. But if you want to do uh, nonlinear uh, things, then you need more control of these omega j's. Okay, so what's the full sub-extremal range? 
I'm going to draw a quick picture here. So there are these two dimension, those quantities lambda m squared that I already had up there in the Schwarzschild to Sitter case, and then there's a divided by m. And so here's one ninth, and here's one. Um, and, and there's this picture here. And uh, all parameters that uh, lie in this, uh, the shaded region here, they're so-called sub-extremal, oh, full sub-extremal, sorry. They're so-called sub-extremal, um, and the reason is basically that uh, for parameters in this range, um, the Curtis-Sitter black hole has, again, two horizons that are uh, at distinct locations. So some analog of this function, f of r, in the Curtis-Sitter case, that's a more complicated function involving an a, uh, a term involving a squared. That function is uh, uh, basically a fourth degree polynomial, and you want it to have simple roots, three of which are positive. Again, that happens exactly in this shaded region here. Okay, so it's a bit of uh, algebra with polynomials. Um, okay, so that's, uh, uh, these are the results uh, that were known about um, resonance expansion. And uh, I'm not going to improve on that result in any shape or form, except um, I will discuss a regime in which mode stability um, uh, provably holds as well, beyond the first two settings. So, as I've said a few times, the, um, uh, the object of interest for me in this talk is the set of quasi-normal modes, which depends on these three black hole parameters. And it's uh, the set of all these omega j's that might appear uh, in that expansion. Um, or more precisely, and so that now answers your question, uh, it's all those complex numbers omega for which there exists some function u, which is smooth on x, such that the wave equation, so box g lambda m a, okay, so the wave equation on that Curtis iterator space time, um, is solved by e to the minus i omega p star times u of x. Okay, so these are exactly all the modes. Okay, so. It turns out that in this case, the smoothness assumption of the mode solution u of x here um, is uh, what um, makes this here a discrete subset. So that's really part of uh, this Peterson, Peterson Bashi result. That indeed, that set is a discrete subset obtained via some analytic threshold theorem argument. Um, okay, and so the smoothness here, especially smoothness at the horizons, that's sort of the boundary condition, uh, the outgoing boundary condition. Okay, so this is a discrete set. And uh, we're interested in understanding it. Um, yes. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. I often forget mentioning that. Yeah. So the outgoing, co the outgoing condition is replaced by a smoothness condition? Yeah. So it's uh, the smoothness. So because I uh, switched to this T star coordinate, which has the property that its level sets are transversal to these horizons, if you write this out in, in the usual, so in the Schwarzschild case, for instance, um, if you wrote it in the usual TR coordinates, something like this, then the outgoing condition would mean that u is supposed to be e to the i you know, r over r, that thing. Um, and so this is when r is going to infinity. And then using the horizon, you have some other sort of oscillatory behavior there. But if you translate this to the better time coordinate that is actually um, regular across the horizon, then it amounts to smoothness of the, um, of the spatial part. Okay. Other questions? Wait, when did the talk start? Uh, nine. nine. Oh, okay, very good. Someone thought 9.30 and I was puzzled that only three minutes had passed. <laughs> <laughs> Relativity talk, who knows? <laughs> okay, so <laughs> most, most stability, as I said, is this uh, statement that uh, either omega is zero or imaginary part is negative. And, um, uh, and uh, so let me just uh, recall the state of the arc for that as well. So in what, uh, what cases is that known? Um, well, when a is equal to zero, so in the Schwarzschild to Sitter case, uh, this is actually uh, very easy to check. Um, so this is really a, a little exercise. It's basically the same kind of argument that you use to show that, for instance, uh, Laplace or minus Laplace for spectral theory 
plus a non-negative potential compactly supported, say, in R or 3 or whatever, um, doesn't have eigenvalues uh, nor embedded, uh, embedded spectrum, so embedded eigenvalues. So it's about an integration by parts argument or unique continuation, uh, but it's very standard. Um, so I don't actually know who to attribute this to, really. Um, then it's known for very slowly rotating black holes. So that's uh, this. Uh, so that was proved by Dyatlov, and also follows from uh, Bashi's paper, um, sort of by perturbation theory. Holds by perturbative methods. Um, okay, and then uh, this uh, peterson bashi result that I mentioned there uh, is the statement that the set of quasi normal modes intersected with a, a suitable half space of an imaginary part omega is bigger than minus that uh, constant C0, uh, that this is a finite set. Okay. But uh, that does not entail a mode stability statement. And in fact, there are results by, um, so not exactly in the De Sitter context, by, uh, but in the um, Kerr context by Moshidis and Schlappenthal Rothman, that show that for a certain uh, variance of the wave equation, either like the Gordon equation, wave equation coupled to a little potential or slight metric perturbations of the setup, uh, mode stability actually fails. Um, so for just sort of mild perturbations of the space time. So um, it's a very delicate setting, exactly because it turns out there do not exist conserved energies that just tell you on the nose solutions of the equation cannot possibly grow uh, uh, as time goes to infinity. Um, okay, and uh, so another aspect of uh, having to control, you know, having to sh show mode stability is that it's really a statement about all resonances in the closed upper half plane, except at zero perhaps, um, including small resonances. So you don't only have to control some sort of high energy resonances, but you really have to control everything. Um, so that's sort of the difficulty in establishing mode stability. Um, so all Q and M's or resonances. So Q and M's is what the physicists usually say uh, in uh, the upper half space. Okay, so that being difficult, of course, um, one can also try to look at sort of semi-classical regimes uh, when omega gets large in some sense, and that's what Savarito and Zworski that I had mentioned earlier in words uh, did in 1998. Um, so let me make this here part four. So Savarito and Zworski. In 98, uh, they actually showed that um, in the non rotating case, that there are resonances, which I'll write omega ln, which are very well approximated by a lattice. And so um, I didn't write out the constants, but it's basically L minus I times n, and they scale like 1 divided by m, the mass of the black hole. And so here, imagine L is an integer, n is a positive integer. Um, and, this, uh, and these resonances exist at those locations, up to numerical constants here, um, say when n is fixed and l is sufficiently large. Okay, so this uh, controls high energy resonances. And uh, Dyatlov, uh, in these aforementioned works, also uh, describes resonances very precisely in the slowly rotating case, in which case there are additional corrections of order A divided by L, I believe. Don't quote me on that. Um, okay, so the picture uh, that we have so far then is the following. So draw the complex plane in omega, and uh, I want to understand the set of quasi normal modes. And uh, okay, so at least in certain regimes, um, it has been shown that there exist these uh, approximate lattices of resonances. Okay, uh, so these are these omega LNs, let's say. Um, then, by the result of Peterson and Bashi, it's known that uh, basically, um, you know, there are only finitely many in some upper half space. So if you go sufficiently high up, there are none. Um, okay, so that's what one knows. But then there's this sort of uh, mystery region uh, when the resonances are small. So there's no small parameter left over to somehow help you in your analysis. 
um, where it's not clear at all how to somehow study this set, um, except for numerical investigations, of course. And so that's some of the, um, the starting point here. And uh, I should also point out, perhaps just sort of for physical context, right, so in what case is mode stability here known? In the schwarz de Sitter case, so A is equal to zero, then perturbatively, the black holes very slowly, slowly rotating, um, and that's it. But most black holes that are observed apparently in the actual universe have very high angular momentum, so they're somehow out here in the parameter range. But the cosmological constant is very small, so somehow we're, somehow this is the regime where somehow most black holes seem to be found in nature, um, and so there is no result for that. Um, okay, so this is some of the, uh, the motivation now for um, the theorem that I'm going to write down now. Um, I should add that uh, the real motivation uh, comes from food, because uh, Maciek Dworski has this resonance review article, 2017, I think, where he poses some conjectures, and uh, the odd-numbered conjectures, if you solve one of them, you get a three-star mission law dinner, and unfortunately, there was a conjecture number four, and four is unfortunately an even number, so it's only a two-star dinner. Um, and so that conjecture was uh, to prove most stability and you know, exponential decay for solutions of the wave equation on Curtis Sitter space times for a large range of parameters. And so I managed to get some range of parameters and convinced Maciek that it was uh, to be considered large. And, uh, so he yielded. And uh, I made a dinner reservation for June 9th at a place called The Restaurant in Zurich. <laughs> I knew how to prove it and just wanted to do it, but the dinner was a very, very nice addition. I hope he pays for the wine as well. <laughs> okay. So, um, the theorem um, that I proved now uh, is the following. So, um, well, epsilon positive is delta positive, such that the following holds. So, if uh, the parameters, so if lambda m squared, that is very small, so if this is less than delta and positive, uh, and the uh, sort of specific angular momentum A divided by m uh, lies in the interval from 0 to 1 minus epsilon, then, um, well, first of all, mode stability holds. Time. Um, and so that's uh, now the first part of the title. And the second part of the uh, title was shallow quasi normal modes. And uh, that means the following statement namely, sorry, yeah. um, namely, one can also describe this set um, in a suitable half space completely when the imaginary part of omega is bigger than minus any constant you like times square root lambda. Okay, so somehow, you know, all these quantities really should have physical dimensions, and it turns out that frequency has the same dimension as square root of lambda, okay? Um, this set here uh, converges as this dimensionless quantity lambda times the mass square root of the black hole goes down to zero to an explicit set, namely minus i times square root lambda over three times the integers. Okay, so this is slightly terribly written because, of course, I should only restrict to those that also lie in that, you know, upper half space here. Okay. Um, and not only do you have convergence of the quasi normal mode spectrum, but you also have convergence of the corresponding resonance states, these uh, solutions U um, in, a, in a smooth topology. Uh, one has to be a bit careful here because uh, as the parameters vary, the manifold in which the space time is defined varies as well. Um, but uh, sort of if you fix uh, a part of sort of the limiting space time that I'll explain in just a moment, um, then uh, sort of a compact subset of that also exists uh, in a natural way in all the uh, space times with slightly positive mass. Okay, so there's a natural sense in which you can uh, state this convergence here. Um, okay. So the limit is Schwarzschild? The, the uh, no. So the square goes to zero. Yeah, so, there, so there are two limits actually. It's a singular limit, and I'll explain it in a moment. And uh, this here is actually. This is the quasi-normal mode spectrum for the Sitter space. 
the cosmological constant lambda. Okay. So sorry, but uh, all, the, all the resonances you had before they were simple. Um, so uh, the Desider ones, they're not. So there, there's a, a finite, but you know, bigger than one-dimensional space of resonances uh, for all of them, except for the zeroth one. And the, that's it, I think. Um, and the second one, perhaps I forget. But uh, so for in the Desider case, you have a higher-dimensional space. The pole is still simple, so you don't get T star powers. Um, but the space uh, is, is uh, more than one dimensional. And so I don't know what happens if you turn on the mass of the black hole, whether perhaps you suddenly get some Jordan block or something. So I don't know about that. Edit. So they might become non simple immediately. Okay, so uh, let me just briefly explain uh, the uh, sort of parameter regimes here. So, as I said, in the actual universe, um, perhaps you might imagine you have a black hole of mass. I don't know, 50 masses of the sun, 50 solar masses. So somehow your m is fixed and a is you know, some sort of sub-extremal angular momentum. Um, and then this theorem applies when the cosmological constant is sufficiently small. That's a pretty sensible physical setup because in our universe, uh, somehow lambda is supposed to be 10 to the minus 120. Uh, so that's certainly smaller than any delta positive. <laughs> um, you can also take the other perspective that you fix lambda, um, and then this result holds when the mass of the black hole is sufficiently small. And that's the setting in, uh, that I will just um, uh, use to explain um, what is uh, happening. Okay, so in particular, I don't know I erased it, but in particular the result, you know, I drew, I drew this line here for a very small lambda and the sub-extremal range of the angular momentum. This uh, result covers that and shows that solution of the wave on those Curtis-Hitter space-times uh, do decay exponentially fast uh, to a constant, it turns out that zero is always a quantum mode and the uh, corresponding mode solution is a constant. So I didn't write that down explicitly. Okay, but related to sort of your question and how the Sitter space shows up, uh, let me just go back to the, um, uh, to, uh, the form of the metric for which we studied the wave equation. So let's look at the schwarzer de Sitter case, so a is equal to zero. And then we have uh, uh, this metric, depending on lambda, m and zero. And I'll also take lambda to be equal to three, which simplifies some expressions. Okay, so this metric uh, has the following form. It's one minus two m over r minus r squared times dt squared plus some extra terms. Right, I wrote down the metric earlier. Okay, and so now we're uh, studying the limit uh, when lambda is fixed. And uh, we're interested in understanding what happens when m goes down to zero. Okay, so we're looking at the wave equation associated with this metric. So the first thing to do is, of course, understand uh, the limiting behavior of this metric itself. And let's do that when r is some fixed non-zero number, and we let m go down to zero. All right, so then naively, you can just set m equals zero in this expression, and you get as the limiting metric something that we'll call g sub, well, d sub ds which is equal to minus 1 minus r squared dt squared plus uh, you know, further terms. And this is exactly, as I mentioned, uh, the de Sitter metric with cosmological constant 3. And so what's funny about this metric, so let me write down one more term here. 1 minus r squared reciprocal dr squared plus the standard metric on the two sphere. And what's interesting about this metric here is that it's actually a polar coordinate description of a metric that's perfectly smooth across r equals zero. If you pass to Euclidean coordinates there. Okay, so in that limit, the black hole has completely disappeared and given way to a metric that actually extends smoothly across the point where the black hole disappeared. Um, and uh, in particular, you don't have a black hole event horizon anymore, but you do have so this cosmological horizon um, that's still there at uh, r equals one uh, in this case. Okay, so that's one limit. And uh, so that's sort of the limit in which you don't have to scale any spatial or temporal uh, numbers here. So you can sort of roughly imagine that if the wave operator on Sitter space has a resonance, and it exactly has resonances on the set, which you can either check by special functions like hypergeometric function calculations or some more clever arguments uh, as well. You can imagine that if the limiting object here has resonances, then Perhaps the um, you know the perturbation here uh, 
perturbs these resonances just a little bit. But notice that's a very singular perturbation because you're sort of getting rid of a black hole that for every positive value of m is always there. And the curvature, for instance, of this metric here um, is you know, very much uh, uh, blowing up when you, when you come close to the black hole. Um, OK, so that's, uh, that's one regime, but it explains perhaps the emergence of the sitter quasi-normal modes. And the other regime is a bit more, uh, more hidden, perhaps. And so here's how you can see it. So imagine that you're, uh, you have this black hole space-time where m is very small. And you want to uh, be an observer trying to figure out what exactly is going on right near the black hole. So you would pass to rescale coordinates, r divided by m, call it r hat, so that r hat sort of remains bounded as the black hole shrinks down and you as the observer next to it shrink down just the same rate. Um, and if you rescale space, you have to rescale time in just the same way. Okay, so you do this coordinate change really and uh, plug it in here. So in other words, t is equal to m t hat and uh, r is equal to m r hat. When you plug this in, you get an m squared times dt hat squared out. So it's a, uh, undo this overall scaling here. And so if you look at uh, this metric here, um, in these hatted coordinates, so you fix r hat and you let m go down to zero, uh, then what happens is, well, uh, r hat is fixed like 10, m is very tiny, so r, which is tiny times fixed, is tiny. Okay, so this r squared goes away, and you're just left with minus 1 minus 2 over r hat. dt hat squared plus the reciprocal of that times the r hat squared plus r hat squared times the metric on the two sphere. Okay, so that's the full expression. And that is exactly the metric of a Schwarzschild black hole. With mass now. And in that limit, what has happened is that the cosmological horizon for the Schwarzschild sitter black hole, which is sort of a fixed, at a fixed radius r, has been scaled away off to infinity and has disappeared. So you still have the event horizon, but the metric is now asymptotically flat. So it doesn't have a cosmological horizon anymore. And so some of this existence of two different limits is the hallmark, of course, of a singular limit regime. Uh, so in that sense, this theorem is a statement about the perturbation stability of resonances under uh, singular perturbations. And so the very last thing now is, so as I said, the Sitter limit uh, is what produces the quasi-normal modes uh, in this limiting set there. So what about the Schwarzschild uh, limiting uh, black hole here? Um, well, it turns out that if you rescale time, then you have to rescale frequency in this opposite way. And so quasi-normal mode omega that lives in some upper half space, some fixed upper half space, gets multiplied by m, and m is super tiny. So essentially, this omega hat, essentially, like in some limit when m goes to 0, lives in the closed upper half space. Okay. So basically, imagine part of omega hat lies in the closed upper half space. Those are the resonances of the uh, Schwarzschild limit that you have to understand. And uh, so part of this uh, theorem that you use this as a black box, the mode stability for the Schwarzschild limit, or really the general case of this theorem for the curved black hole in the sub range, which is uh, something that was essentially proved by Whiting and schlafentorf Um Okay, so that's the input here. So because the curved black hole is one of the singular limits, satisfies mode stability, that doesn't contribute any quasi-normal modes uh, in that limit up there. The very last thing is that the Savareto Dvorsky resonances, they were, they scaled like uh, minus imaginary part over m, and uh, they're actually disjoint uh, from that regime that I'm studying here. Okay, so the Savareto Dvorsky um, setup uh, concerns a completely different regime uh, than the one that's covered by this here. So, okay, so I'll end here, and uh, I'm happy to take any further questions. Thank you so much. Are there some questions? Yeah. Uh, sorry, I have a quick question. So, uh, do you have some sort of uh, more quantitative up or uh, bound on the gap between the resonances and, uh, or, or, or essentially the speed of convergence you have there with the second? Uh, the, the speed here? Yes. Uh, I don't. Um, so it's done with some. I mean, uh, that you have resonance nearby is done with the Rocher theorem, so you only get continuous dependence. 
Um, I would, so it's a very interesting question. I mean, somehow standard perturbation theory doesn't directly apply because the, you know, it's a very singular limit. Um, but it would be very interesting to see whether you can extract some uh, you know, Taylor series in M or something like that of the quantum normal modes. Um, so I had a, an undergrad student at MIT still who actually did some numerics on that, and it seemed like the quantum normal modes were actually numerically smooth down to M equals zero. Um, and uh, yeah, but I, I never got around to trying to prove something like that. And, and in, in these other like general uh, sort of results that you cited before, did they give in these sort of asymptotic regimes some sort of uh, more quantitative dis uh, distance between the real axis and uh, yeah, so, so this away is from zero? Yeah, yeah, so this is completely explicit. So in this case, um, I forget the numbers, unfortunately, but there's like one, one half and then n plus a half or something like that. And uh, there's also a square root of 1 minus 9 lambda m squared in the numerator here. So uh, 3 squared 3 here, you know, some completely explicit thing. Um, and, uh, but it's only you know, something explicit. In principle, you can get a full asymptotic expansion in 1 over L as well, plus L to the minus infinity error. So that's sort of as explicit. Is it for A, just for the case A equals 0? Or? Yes. And then Dyatlov showed in, in that case uh, that this can be adjusted um, with uh, you know, an extra function, depending also. So here, M is the azimuthal mode, not the mass of the black hole. But there's some uh, extra symbol here in L uh, that governs the location of the resonances uh, to infinite order in 1 over L. So it's a very precise statement. But it's only a high-frequency statement. But that's, of course, the kind of uh, information that you need if you want to prove this resonance expansion. You have some contour shifting argument. You just need to understand sort of what's happening at infinity to justify shifting through infinity many poles and landing uh, on a new contour that is a fixed distance away from poles so that you still have uh, you know, high energy control on your resolvent. So in the future, in this, this guys, where would they sit with the, the scaling you have adopted? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, when uh, lambda is fixed, yes. uh, right, so the picture would be uh, that this is uh, just along the negative imaginary axis. And so there is some sort of line uh, above which you have so this uniform convergence, as long as the line is, of course, uh, you know, doesn't hit exactly one of those points. And then the separated Tsvorsky resonances that would be, or Dyatlov would be down here. They will yield the one over n. That's right. They're, they're way below. So in fact, um, it stands to reason that uh, one can uh, sharpen this result by saying that uh, you get this for all imaginary part omega bigger than minus little constant divided by m where the constant is exactly anything less than whatever numerator I have over there. Uh, so that might be true, but um, it's sort of this usual thing when you try to uh, you know, open the curtain more and more to see more and more resonance, you have to pass to higher and higher regularity spaces. And that scaling here uh, allows you to just work with uh, you know, fixed regularity spaces. If you want to go further then you, and get this uniform scaling, you would have to have some Gray spaces or something rather. And uh, I know there are some experts on this in the audience, but uh, I'm not one of them, so perhaps uh, uh, you know, somebody wants to and the Schwarzschild, that. I mean, the Schwarzschild metric uh, does not contribute in this... Uh... Yeah, it doesn't contribute at all. Um, and so you see that, right, the separated Zworski kind of resonance is there, you know, this divided by m. And so if you pass to the, um, to the frequency variable for the Schwarzschild black hole, uh, they're actually, you know, they're uh, sort of constant. And so um, okay. one might expect that some of the Schwarzschild... Red, so actually for the Schwarzschild black hole resonances were defined by separated Zworski. So you, can, you could expect that perhaps the resonances, these very far uh, down ones, um, are actually well approximated by 1 over m times those guys here. Mm -hmm. uh, but actually in the Kerr case, for instance, resonances have not yet been rigorously defined. Um, uh, but you know, one, one might expect such a statement to be true. So there are also numerics. Uh, so I don't think they're on my web page. I should probably put them there. But there's also a video where some of the resonances really do come together on the negative imaginary axis. It's very very fun to watch. The resonance, they are, uh, I mean, the, the, all, all these uh, amount to looking at ODEs, no? Um, yeah, so in the Schwarzschild case, you can reduce it to ODEs for any fixed uh, angular momentum, I mean, every L. Um, but then it's uh, difficult to actually, I mean, then somehow you would have to have some uniformity in L. Um, so in general, in general, they are not related to just uh, several couple of ODEs? Probably we can, one can probably prove the result that way, but it's really done with fully PDE microlocal methods. And in physics, they never really 
Well, they're really good at computing and doing numerics, so it's not known in physics. No? Um, so I think there have been numerical uh, investigations into this mode stability question, um, and they found that it seems to be, I believe, true in the full subextremal range. I would have to look up the references for that. Um, but uh, um, one would think so, but uh, even when I once asked some Vitor Cardoso uh, about the quasinormal modes for a certain kind of black hole, it turned out the low-lying ones had never been computed. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so sometimes it's uh, funny what things exactly they care about. There are also some uh, conjectures, for instance, the Schwarzschild case about resonances very far down the imaginary axis, which are, you know, for scattering theory purposes, weird, one, one might argue. And they have some precise conjectures that they're given by, you know, log pi, something rather uh, real part, minus i times something very big. So they have all kinds of uh, interesting things there um, that one might, one might want to try and investigate. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Are there more questions? No more questions? Okay, so let's thank the speaker. Thank you.